Hey everyone, I'm John Roden, and I saw a bird today. I actually saw a bush tit, which is a very charismatic little bird that we see here in uh, the western part of North America down into Central America. And not only did I see a bush tit, but I was able to identify that it was a female. And that was because of her light eye. Males and juveniles have dark eyes. And I, I thought that and I verified it with one of the galbatrosses, Joanna Wu, who actually joined I Saw a Bird earlier um, in the series. And she uh, verified that and also reminded me that Female Bird Day is coming up this weekend, which is an effort to uh, understand how we find and see female birds. And so I think we're gonna drop a, a link in the chat, which can help you if you wanna help the galbatrosses understand female birds better when you're birding this weekend, uh, use that link. Thanks for that tip, John. And I'm so excited for Female Bird Day. So I also saw a bird today. I saw a morning dove. Um, I was uh, I was like looking out the window this morning. I, I first heard that classic cooing from the morning dove. And I was like, oh, where is it? And then this dove was perched right outside my window. So that was really cool. It's a really cool start to the day. Always good to get a first, a first thing, bird first thing, right? Mm -hmm. um, well, welcome everybody. We have uh, another great show uh, lined up for you this month. Um, first up, we'll be talking about the Recovering America's Wildlife Act and its important to, in, importance to birds and people. Um, then, since we're getting into beach season, it's time to talk about sharing the so shore with birds and other wildlife. And finally, we're really excited to share our screen with rehabilitated, non-releasable hummingbirds from Georgia Audubon. And I know there's a lot of hummingbird lovers out there, so you'll definitely wanna stick around for that. Yeah, we have an awesome lineup for you today. So for our very first segment, like John said, we're gonna go um, do a deep dive into the Recovering America's Wildlife Act. So also it just started thunderstorming where I am in the East Coast, so you might hear some rain, <laughs> some good rain for the season. Um, but last month, Congresswoman Debbie Dingell from Michigan and Congressman Jeff Gordonberry from Nebraska reintroduced the Recovering America's Wildlife Act. And many of you may remember a report that came out in 2019 from American Bird Conservancy, the Cornell Lab of Ornithology, among others that revealed that we've lost a staggering 3 billion birds in North America since 1970. So in response to that, this bill will be a very critical part of how we respond to that loss of birds. And this dedicated funding that the bill provides will help state tribal wildlife agencies, state and tri tribal wildlife agencies proactively conserve vulnerable species, um, such as black terns, like the one you see here, common loons, and many, many more birds. So it'll also help create jobs for people in communities across the country. And unfortunately, uh, Congresswoman Dingle won't be able to make it to today's episode due to an unexpected medical issue. So our hearts reach out to her and um, we invite you all to please join us in wishing her a speedy recovery and uh, thank her for all the work that she's done for birds and other wildlife. So with that being said, we are really excited to welcome on Vice President and Executive Director of Audubon, Nebraska, Crystal Stoner and Senior Director of Wildlife Partnerships at National Wildlife Federation, Naomi Edelson. Thank you both for joining us today. Of course, happy to be here. My yes. pleasure, thank you. Yes, welcome, so uh, we're, we're thrilled to have you. And we've given a really, or Christine gave a very basic intro for the Recovering America's Wildlife Act. But um, Naomi, could you tell us a little bit more about what it is and what it will do? Sure. Can I just tell you about the bird I saw? <laughs> I saw last week a red knot, which is what Christine has on her picture. I took my mom, who I haven't seen since the pandemic, to Cape May, and we saw red birds that are migrating from southern Argentina, stop in Delaware Bay, and then go to the Arctic. It was a big thrill. So that's the bird that I want to just share that I saw. And yeah, it's amazing. It's amazing. Uh, they're in dire straits. Unfortunately, they're listed as endangered. But this bill, Recovering America's Wildlife Act, will help send funds, as you said, back to states and tribes to help recover this species. The bill does is a big 
game-changing bill. It's one of the most important bills we could ever work on because basically it sends money back to every single state and territory in the country and the tribes uh, on a scale that we've never seen before. And we can talk a little bit more about that, but it will do two big things. It will recover those, money can be used to recover those species already listed as endangered and threatened like the red knot, and it will prevent all the other species from becoming endangered. And there's a list of about 12,000 species of which many are birds, but also plants and other animals that uh, could will use the funds. So it's a really big deal and it helps every part of the country and ev most, not every species, but most every species that's at risk. And the uh, philosophy, if I can just, add something here that most people probably know, but we are in a wildlife crisis. We've learned a lot about the Amazon. We hear a lot about what's happening in the oceans, but here at home in the United States, we have a huge, huge problem with birds, but mussels, freshwater fish. We have problems with um, monarch butterflies and many, many other species. Sometimes we call it the quiet crisis because the alarm bells haven't been ringing as much until more recently. And this bill is focused on taking care of all that crisis and addressing it. Yeah, this bill is definitely incredibly important and we'll, we'll go all into it during the segment. So um, for the first question I have for um, you, Crystal, I was wondering if, if passed, this bill will provide something called dedicated wildlife funding to states. So could you just talk a little bit about what this dedicated funding means and who will get this funding? Yeah, sure, absolutely. So, you know, it's relatively simple as you think about it. Dedicated means that we have made a commitment that those funds would be available every single year. And, you know, that seems intuitive. That seems like a logical way that you would try to address the wildlife crisis that Naomi is talking about. Um, but the fact of the matter is that right now state wild, it goes to state wildlife agencies and they're struggling because they don't have the funds they need and it's very small. It can be in the nature of $500,000 a year. Um, so this dedicated funding is really, it's doing what most people expect. It's putting fundings available so that we can be proactive and plan for the long-term and really address the crisis that Naomi's talking about. In terms of who gets it, it would go to every state in the nation, it would go to the territories, and it would also go to the tribes. And so the recipient would be the state wildlife agency or the appropriate entity uh, within that tribe. But there's tremendous opportunity for sharing and doing a whole variety of conservation projects. It's a big job we have ahead of us, so I think it will take a lot of people. So I expect there'll be a lot of sharing um, and collaboration as this rolls out. Thanks, Crystal. And it, you know, it really is critical that that funding, right, that that it is distributed and is distributed uh, widely like that, like you say, and deliberately. Um, of course, being Audubon, we would like to know how will Recovering America's Wildlife Act affect bird species specifically? And are there any examples of a bird species that might benefit from this bill? Um, and Crystal, could you talk about that and potentially some of Audubon's work relevant to that? Sure. Yes, absolutely. So, you know, first comes I'm I'm Audubon, Nebraska. So I'm here in a grassland state. So what first comes to my mind is both the eastern and western meadowlark. So our grasslands are very much in trouble. Our grassland birds are declining. So something that we can do is that these funds would hit down and they would be able to do habitat restoration, uh, among other things. So what we do in Nebraska is we do a lot of work with private landowners because they own most of the habitat that the Western Meadowlark and the Eastern Meadowlark need. Um, so we can work with them to restore that habitat, such as removing invasive trees um, and, um, and helping put prescribed fire on the landscape. You know, so that's one example. Another way, it's important to think that we don't actually know everything that we need to about every species of birds. So another example is in Vermont, they did a project with the golden winged warbler and the blue winged warbler. So, you know, as you can imagine, everybody knows the phrase warbler neck, right? As you're looking up in the trees and trying to, um, trying to find the warblers and follow them. Well, if there's not very many, 
And it's important that you really target where you're doing the conservation work to where the birds are. It'd be helpful to know where they are. And so we did a telemetry project where we put telemetry on the birds, follow them, and therefore could know exactly where we should target that work. Sometimes it's not that simple. It's not that intuitive in terms of the projects that you should be doing. Um, so for example, on the coast of Louisiana back in 2005, 2008, after the hurricanes came through, um, we had on, we had, let's see, I get the name right, the Paul J. Rainey Sanctuary. So this is Audubon's oldest and largest sanctuary. And we had a thousand acres of wetlands that were so critical for so many birds like the least tern, which just came off the threatened and endangered species list. So really important habitat, the hurricanes kind of destroyed all of those wetlands. And so now it's more of just open water habitat. So because there's so few wetlands available, what they've done is they've gone in and almost created islands or like terraces in that area to create that nesting habitat back for those birds. So sometimes you have to kind of recreate the environment that you need specifically for those birds. And another key aspect um, that I think what will really happen, we think about habitat delivery, we think about research and learning about the birds, we think about special cases where we have to recreate habitat, but the other piece is just engaging other people. And so I think later today you're going to hear about Share the Shore, you know, and other programs like that. So to communicate to people, because everybody loves birds, of course, right? But to communicate the trouble that they're in and what people can do in their own backyards or on the shores or other places to make a difference, that's an important strategy so we can all be a part of the solution. So all of these things are desperately needed. Um, and with the additional funds, we'd be able to do so much more, so much more for wildlife. Right, and it, it's clear that this will obviously help and create a huge impact on birds and um, conservation. And I'm also wondering outside of that, where else will Recovering America's Wildlife Acts have both significant and measurable impacts? Um, Naomi, could you take this one? Yeah, I, th I think that, you know, there's no question where wildlife thrives, people thrive. And so that's what where th this money will directly help for one with jobs. I mean, that's part of what's happening now. There's a lot of effort after the, well, we're still in the pandemic. As the pandemic hopefully ends quickly, there'll be all kinds of jobs through construction, like putting in fish culvert passages, those big highway wildlife crossings. Habit, like as Crystal talked about, habitat restoration, those are all local jobs that require heavy equipment and other things that will be very uh, good paying jobs. But there's also the whole outdoor recreation business that depends upon healthy wildlife. Binocular companies, you know, Wild Birds Unlimited is supporting this legislation and so is Bass Pro Shops because they know their business is dependent on the outdoors and nature tourism, the bed and breakfast is, I'm planning a trip with my mom. She's really on my mind these days, you know, and we're going to Utah and we're gonna stay in all these little independent motels that only exist because of nature-based tourism. And uh, the other thing is just simply, you know, we need a healthy environment to survive the era change. We need trees planted along streams to keep the water cooler, to absorb the carbon. You know, we need native plants put in backyards and front yards so they slow the flow and there's not, uh, you know, pollutants running into our waterways where our, where our children are playing. I've seen so many kids playing in my local creek and they don't really know the water isn't really healthy. So everything that we do for wildlife, we, most everything we do will help people directly. Yeah, it seems really clear that this will have benefits for wildlife, for conservation, for humans, for the economy. I mean, there's just a lot of cascading positives um, from, from the act. Um, and, and in addition to funding for states, as you've mentioned, um, Recovering America's Wildlife Act will also places a heavy emphasis on funding to tribes. Um, can you explain the significance of that, Crystal? Yeah, you know, I think, um, I'm really excited, you know, to see this to be a part of it because um, the tribes have certainly been underfunded, just like everybody else, as we start thinking about how we're going to actually 
restore our wildlife. Um, but the tribes, they have 140 million acres. They have a substantial piece of the habitat that so many of these species rely on. And they have over, over 525 federally listed species, meaning those are the ones that are actually on the threatened and endangered species list, right? There's a tremendous desire uh, to be a part of the solution and to help out, but it takes resources, you know? And so, you know, and um, I just wanted to reiterate in nature to one of the questions that came through, um, by being dedicated, it will be dedicated over time. Um, something that as we recognize, um, we wanna make sure it's resilient to, you know, different individuals who are making decisions and that it's set so that it's gonna be 20 years, 30 years in longevity. Um, we know that, you know, to recover the bald eagle, we know how to do that. We did it, we were very successful when we put our minds to it and our resources to it, but it can take 20 years. Um, so we wanna make sure that this is a dedicated funding source to last, but so yes, very excited to see, see the tribal piece. They would get um, $97 million on an annual basis as a part of that. So it's a, sub, it's a substantial um, chunk and, and I'm glad to see it. I'm glad to see it. it's very necessary. Yeah, that's really cool to see. And it's such a good example of how um, conservation groups can work with indigenous leaders to, to protect the planet together. So Congress seems to be at an impasse lately um, on a lot of pieces of legislation. And we actually have a question from someone named Betty on Zoom, who's wondering, do you think Recovering America's Wildlife Act has a real chance of success? And what would that timeline be? Naomi, do you wanna tackle this one? Yeah, thank you. I understand that um, perspective. We've certainly all seen things happen and getting uh, sometimes more, you know, it's a, it's a tough time in our country. And, uh, but I will say that we believe and we've seen that conservation can uh, bridge this political divide. This particular bill, again, led by Mrs. Dingle and Mr. Fortenberry, uh, had last session 185 co-sponsors, bipartisan. And we have so far, we, the bill was only reintroduced on Earth Day. We have 40 and it 40 members of Congress, so we know we're, we're working to get those all those back on, but it ranges from my own member of Congress is Jamie Raskin, who a lot of people have heard about in the news. For, I live in Tacoma Park, Maryland, who's very liberal, loves wildlife, but we also have Congressman Cole from uh, Oklahoma, who's very conservative on the whole other end of the spectrum. And we have many Southerners, Westerners, you know, rural, urban, black, white, and brown. We have a big diversity of members of Congress on this bill. It's very bipartisan. And everyone wants to solve this problem of preventing wildlife from becoming endangered, sometimes for different reasons, but nobody wants that outcome. And so it's bringing a lot of diverse interests to the table. We also have Secretary, um, the new Secretary of Interior, Deb Holland, who was one of our champions when she was a member of Congress. And now she's in the top of the Biden administration. That will help us. And the support, we have 1,500 groups of which Audubon is one and National Wildlife Federation that I work for is one, but we have 1,500 different kinds of groups and businesses backing this bill. And so we think it's that, that's the strength of the bill. And we, it doesn't mean it will be easy, but we believe this appeals to people for a lot of different reasons and therefore we will be successful this year. That's it. The timeline is we hope to see some action in the House this summer. So we're working to get co-sponsors now. We're waiting for the Senate bill to be introduced and we'd like to get this done this year. Yeah, exactly. And I think um, both John and I can say that we've learned so much from both of you today about this really important piece of legislation that like you mentioned, Naomi, is bipartisan. So this is the end of our um, Recovering America's Wildlife Act segment, but to our audience, we've gotten quite a few questions about um, how we can all support this um, piece of legislation. So stay tuned, we'll actually show you exactly how to do that at the end of the episode. All right, thank you both. Thank you both so much. Thank you. All right. Well, that was um, that was really um, really interesting and, and edifying, and I'm glad that we'll have the chance to to share with folks at the end of the of the show on how they can help support it. Um, shifting gears a little bit, 
many of us are lucky to be enjoying warmer weather in the Northern Hemisphere, perhaps a little bit too warm in some cases, I think, recently even. Um, but it means that it's time not only for enjoying that warmer weather, but also for nesting shorebirds. And at Audubon, we often talk about the importance of sharing the shore with wildlife while we're enjoying the beach, which is something I'm really passionate about. In fact, it's part of my origin story at Audubon. I was hired initially by our chapter in New York City to run the community science programs that monitored shorebirds and horseshoe crabs in Jamaica Bay. And here in Los Angeles, I volunteer for our chapter uh, monitoring snowy plovers and least terns. So it's something very near and dear to my heart. Um, with that all being said, we're really excited to welcome to the show Audubon Delta Stewardship Manager, Melinda Averhart, and a very special advocate for sharing the shore on her local beach here in California, Nikki, and her dad, Nader Jandagi. So welcome to all of you. Hi, everyone. Hi, Hi everyone. <laughs> so let's start off with um, a quick question. I'm gonna kick, off, kick it off with you, Melinda. So could you tell us what Audubon Share the Shore Initiative is all about and the stewardship work that you've done, I believe in Mississippi, Louisiana, and Florida? Absolutely, thank you. Um, the Share the Love, Share the Shore campaign is Audubon's effort to help protect beach nesting birds such as least terns and back of me here and black skimmers and piping plovers and their tiny chicks. Um, it's our way of uniting voices of, as scientists, beachgoers and bird lovers to help reduce the threats uh, to these very vulnerable species. So we're using um, elements that people love about the beach um, as tools for helping to understand uh, the distance that these sensitive species need to nest in peach, peace, uh, such as um, six kayaks or 16 fishing poles or even five bay boats. So just using those concepts to help um, give these birds a little bit of space. I'd say um, the common thread that I've noticed um, from place to place, regardless of where I am, is that uh, people have the same passion for um, conservation and for the environment and they want to help. So um, my work, uh, much like John's, I, I started at a, a small chapter in uh, Fort Myers, Florida, uh, working with their stewardship program. And I've moved on to some other places to help um, grow and manage and support this awesome fleet of bird stewards. That's awesome. Thanks. Thanks, Melinda. And thanks for all of your great work. Um, now, Nikki, uh, first of all, I love your rabbit ears. Uh, a, a little bird told me that you've been helping to protect snowy plovers on the beach. Can you tell us about that a little bit? Yes. So um, one day on the beach, I was walking where snowy plovers were, and then a dog um, walked in and scared the snowy plovers away. So um, my dad got a sign that said no dogs allowed, allowed and I wanted to um, help the snowy plovers. So I put the sign. That is great. Thank you for that great work that you did. I think we actually have a video of you in action. So maybe we can play that now. All right. I love you, doggy, but you can't go here because it says no dogs allowed. But I still love you. Hi, everybody. This is me, Nikki. And today we're talking about snowy plovers. Some are around here and some dogs went in here. So we want to protect them by putting a no dog sign maybe somewhere here. And this is the dog sign, and I'm ready to put it in. There we go. Now this is perfect. Wildlife Sanctuary. No dogs. Please stay out of areas where these um, maybe endangered birds are. <laughs> That's such a wonderful video, Nikki and Nader. Um, and everyone watching agrees. They love this video as well. If anyone wants to rewatch it, it is on Audubon's TikTok channel. Um, 
So Nader, some people might be wondering, where are you and Nikki based exactly? Um, yeah, good question. So we're based in Southern California in Los Angeles. Um, and if you're familiar, I think you're gonna get on the screen. Here we go. So downtown LA is kind of at the top right. And then we live in Santa Monica to the west of that. And I've kind of circled the three main areas that the snowy plovers actually come and visit us. Um, up by Malibu on the left is Surfrider Beach that they go to. Down south in El Segundo by the airport is uh, Dockweiler Beach. And we live in Santa Monica right in the middle. So now let's kind of zoom in and, and take you into Santa Monica and that looks like. So here's kind of a closer view and you see I've circled here where the sanctuary area is. It's a fenced off area on the beach. And one thing to notice on this slide is on the upper right is Pacific Coast Highway. So Los Angeles, right? Metropolitan, millions of people, high traffic. People live right there and certainly a big tourist destination. So a lot of people visit this beach all the time, especially during the summer. And it's just phenomenal that Santa Monica Bay um, Audubon Society was able to get this enclosure. So let's zoom in one more time to, here we go. So this is what it looks like. It's fenced off on three sides, the left, the right, and the back. The front of it is actually open to the ocean. So the plovers can, can go to the water, come back, and you can kind of see for scale, a couple of people walking in their shadows. It's not that big, but because it's kind of closed off, you see some of the shrubbery and some of the local uh, vegetation growing. That's what the plovers actually, that's where they go and where they feed on. So kind of a bird's eye view all the way to the bottom. That's awesome. Thanks for that, um, that walkthrough, uh, Nader. Uh, we have a question from Elizabeth on Zoom who just wants to know, how did you and Nikki get inspired to start this project? Oh my. Um, I mean, my family lived to the area in 1983 and I've been going to this beach ever since then, enjoying nature. Um, as soon as Nikki was born, literally we just threw her on the beach right out of the womb. Um, again, to enjoy nature, respect nature. And we watch a lot of nature shows like, you know, Planet Earth, and she loves like Nature Cat and like Wild Kratts. And all these shows, you know, are great for kind of teaching them to, you know, we're, we're not the only beings on this planet. There's other animals, there's other things that we need to respect and, and protect. And like you, she said, late last year, we were on the beach and we noticed a couple dog owners and, you know, we love dogs. Uh, but the dogs were being dogs. They, they basically were going into the enclosure, sniffing it out. And the little plovers were just kind of scurrying around and then trying to get away. So we kind of looked at each other and, and we came up with the idea of, hey, let's try to educate people and let them know there's these little creatures here. So, you know, I, I'm an adult. I'd never done anything like that. And it took a six-year-old to, to actually do something like that and, and let people know. And that's such great work that you're doing lo on a local scale and now on a national scale. So uh, um, a lot of people are thanking you for all that, um, th all the work that you're doing. So as you said, you know, summer is around the corner and a lot of people are on the beach. A lot of us are getting ready for the beach. So Melinda, what are some ways that people can help these birds that are nesting on the shores? Yeah, I think there's some really simple things that people can do to, to help all of these different species. I would say uh, one of the first big things would just be to keep a safe distance from any areas that are um, marked off as, as nesting areas or fenced off. Um, if the birds are reacting to your presence, you're definitely too close. Um, as Nikki and Nader just said, you want to um, keep your dogs off of uh, the beaches where there's nesting birds. And then you always want to uh, keep the beaches clean. Um, so carry out any trash with you that you bring in and also a fishing line. As we all know, it can be um, something that these birds get entangled in um, pretty frequently. And also uh, one of the, the last ones that I think is, is really a, a tough to, to um, kind of work on is not feeding the, the, the gulls and the crows because when we feed these uh, predator birds, unfortunately it draws them into these nesting areas and they can uh, start to eat um, eggs or young chicks. Great tips, Melinda. Thanks for sharing those with us. Um, 
So th those are just general tips. Um, just thinking about tips for motivating young folks to take action in their communities along the lines of what Nikki has done. Um, so these would be tips for kids or folks who works with kids. Um, so maybe we could start with Nader and then get Melinda's perspective as well. Nader? Sure, I, I think that the interesting thing for, for little kids to understand is us adults don't know it all. <laughs> and it's wonderful to, to see the kids actually notice something and these days read up on it, get educated and, and you know record a video. And we showed it to her class in school and it's wonderful to see the kids reacting to another child showing something to them, not necessarily an adult. So for us, it was really her spreading the news and the awareness that got all the other kids riled up. I'd say for um, kind of hitting the, the other aspect as far as educators or people working with youth, um, I would say educators, come find us, find your Autobahn chapters, find your Autobahn state offices, your Autobahn nature centers. Um, people like John and I are here and we are ready to work with you and ready to help spread this message and connect young people with, you know, maybe areas they've never seen before, or, you know, let us come to you and show them things that are new to them. So um, just know that we're here and we're happy to help. So, so please uh, seek us out and come find us. Yeah, absolutely. We're here to help. That is, that's the truth. Um, so for, for Nader and Nikki, um, what's next for you? Um, Any big plans? Yeah, I mean, a couple of things. I, I think we're going to keep uh, raising awareness and showing the video, certainly at the school and the local community, to let dog owners and everybody know to respect the sanctuaries. And I think this summer, what we're going to do with the help of the local Audubon Society is maybe do a letter writing campaign to, to show the local community support uh, to the city, to the county of LA, and just let them know that, hey, we are, we're here. We kind of very much appreciate these little birds. Amazing. So we have time for one more question. It's a very important one. Um, we want to know what is your favorite shorebird? So why don't we start with Nikki and Nader and then go to Melinda. You go first. All right. My favorite shorebird is a snowy plover. Good choice. Um, I've always been partial to pelicans, but I tell you snowy plovers just kind of have a way to grab your heart. I would say mine is uh, the least turn, um, you know, that squeaky squeak and they're just the little ferocious predators of their nests and I just, I adore them and that's the species that really uh, pulled me in that I got started with. Okay. How about you, Christine? What's your favorite shorebird? Oh, it's hard. I have to say either piping plover because they're so cute or red knots, which I have behind me here. What about you, <laughs> since we're, we're going around the table? It is, it is so difficult. My favorite shortbread is generally the last one I saw, right? Because it's the one that I'm the most into. Um, I think that I definitely, I, I mean, we may have a win for snowy plovers, right? Because I do love them uh, here, but um, I love a good oyster catcher as well. I, I'm never gonna turn my nose up at that. So anyway, it's a, it's a very tough choice. Um, all right, well, um, thank you so much for joining us today, Nikki, Nader, and Melinda. Um, and Nikki, you know, I'm just, I'm based a little bit south of you here in Los Angeles, and I really hope we can go birding together in person sometime soon, right? Now that things are opening up again, I would be really happy to do that. So we'll just connect after this show. Um, if you at home want to help support our coastal stewardship work. We'll be dropping a link in the comments. Um, among that will be some fun graphics that you can share on social media and ways to get involved. So please uh, do join us. And as Melinda said, I just wanna reinforce that. We here at Audubon are here to help if you're interested. Thank you all. Bye, thank you all very much, bye. Thank you so much. Bye, Nikki. <laughs> Bye. So 
For our last segment, it would not be a spring migration show without some hummingbirds. And we have just a little inkling of a feeling that this might be one of our audience's favorite topics. So we are super excited to invite wildlife rehabilitator and Georgia Audubon's director of education, Melanie Furr, along with her very charming friend, a ruby-throated hummingbird named Sibley. Hey. Hi, everyone. Thanks for having me. And yeah. And I get so I'm going to turn Sibley's camera on here too. Yeah, take your time. Um, oh my God. The grand reveal. And there he is. Oh my God, he's so beautiful. <laughs> Hi, Sibley. Um, so while we're getting this set up, um, one question I have for you is if you could tell us um, the story behind how Sibley and your other hummingbird, Polly, uh, came under your wing, so to speak. Yes, yeah, so Sibley and Polly were both injured in window collisions. Sorry, too much technology for me here. They were both injured in window collisions. Sibley was injured about three years ago. He'll be celebrating his third birthday this summer. Polly was injured a year and a half ago. And sadly, in Atlanta on our Project Safe Flight routes of more than 100 species that we find, uh, hummingbirds are, are our biggest casualty. So Sibley and Polly were um, the lucky few who managed to be rescued and brought to a wildlife center. They did not regain their flight. Birds with their hollow bones and particularly hummingbirds with their delicate bones, their wings set very quickly. So they were not able to repair his wing. And so he, he cannot fly. He can sort of flutter and hop from perch to perch, as you saw there just a moment ago when I accidentally bumped him. But he gets around his enclosure quite well and obviously is a pretty chill, uh, content little bird. He's been sitting here with me watching this broadcast the whole time. That's awesome. And, you know, it's just something, it's kind of mesmerizing to just watch. We don't normally get to see hummingbirds, you know, sitting and just observe them in their, and they're really amazing um, color and behavior and everything. So clearly, you know, there's a, there's a feeding um, apparatus there, Melanie, and he seems to be eating. Um, I think that people might have an understanding about this, but what, what do they eat and what do we feed them? Um, birds like Sibley and Polly when you have them. So in the wild, hummingbirds drink nectar, as we all know. I've got my favorite style of feeder here behind Sibley. Oh, I need to stop putting my hands that way. I'm sorry, Sibley. They drink nectar from flowers, but they're also insectivores, and a lot of people don't realize that. So they're, they fly and they catch insects. They open their mouths wide and gape and catch insects on the wing. Sibley and Polly can't do that. So they have a special nectar. This nectar that I have here is fortified with protein and vitamins and minerals to try to give them what they need, replicate their, their diet as, as closely as possible. They really prefer just straight up sugar water though. Oops, sorry, camera flipped. And I have some sugar water here. He gets this at nighttime because his nectar that you see here that has the protein in it, this is not flipping. There we go, sorry. His nectar that has the protein, he enjoys it, it's sweet but he has a preference for just straight up sugar water, which he gets at, at bedtime because it has a little bit longer shelf life. This nectar spoils uh, after about six hours. Uh, 
So at nighttime, he gets sugar water. And it's been very interesting to note that he has a distinct preference for the sugar. He's gonna to top off with some sugar water here that I have ready for him at bedtime. Awesome. It's again, just so, so fascinating to watch. Um, clearly, you know, cleanliness is really important to birds. They spend a lot of time bathing and preening. How do hummingbirds typically clean themselves in the wild and do Sibley and Polly do the same thing that, that you see uh, in, a, in a rehab situation like this? So Sibley and Polly can't accomplish quite what their wild counterparts do. In the wild, hummingbirds typically find a wet leaf, wet with rain or dew, and they hover over it and sort of wiggle and shimmy and, and get their feathers wet. They'll also bathe in a light rain. You might see them flying through your sprinkler in the summer on a hot day. But I regularly watch the wild ones in my backyard just out first thing in the morning, wiggling on the plants in the dewdrop. The hummingbirds have such short legs that they wouldn't ever wade into water to bathe. Uh, they're gonna just try to, to wiggle on some moisture. They do like fountains. There are fountains that they like, but they'll again, fly down and sort of hover over it. Sibley and Polly, they get wet leaves. I get a leaf, a waxy leaf, and I spritz it with water and I put it in front of him. You can actually see there's lots of videos of Sibley and Polly bathing. Uh, his hashtag is Survivor Sibley. And I think we might have an upcoming tip TikTok maybe um, with Sibley. So I, I wasn't gonna try to accomplish bathing on camera tonight, but he, he gets wet leaves and, and he just wiggles and has a grand time. We do that daily. <laughs> yeah, we'll have to stay tuned for a future um, TikTok video on that maybe. So we're getting uh, a few questions about how the hummingbirds sleep. So does Sibley only sleep at night or does he sleep at other times of the day? He doesn't sleep at all during the day. When he is molting, he sometimes gets a little groggy, takes a lot of energy to molt and grow new feathers. They do a lot of it in the winter time and early spring before they come back to their breeding grounds. And so when he is losing a lot of feathers or placing a lot of feathers, he might, his eyes might get at half mast for a short time, but he, he never naps during the day, but he goes to bed with the sunset. So I um, have another question. Has anything ever taken you by surprise that you had no idea about? before you started caring for Sibley and Polly? So I guess I've been a little surprised by how distinct their personalities are. You know, I think on an intellectual level, I know that every bird is different, just like every person is different, but it definitely has been very interesting to notice their different personalities. Polly's not on camera with us tonight because she's just a lot more restless. And whereas Sibley's just pretty happy to sit next to me and, you know, look at what's going on around him. Polly is a little flightier, especially in situations that are new to her. Uh, sure, I can show you Polly. That we're in the bird room at my house. Sorry, I just saw a little question pop up, but Polly's over here. And she's there. It's so beautiful. Look at the bird feeders but they have very distinct personalities. You know, I, I'm guessing that females in general are a lot uh, more restless than males because they're the ones busy with all the nesting efforts. Males really just spend a lot of time surveying their territory. Uh, and I, I find that to be true with Sibley and Polly as well. Interesting. Uh, and we have another question from Zoom, which is, are Polly and Sibley friendly with each other? They are friendly with each other and they do seem to enjoy the companionship. In the wild, as you know, they're very territorial. Males and females barely tolerate each other on territory, uh, much less outsiders. But Sibley and Polly do get along quite well. They don't spend a lot of time cozying up. They don't pay a lot of attention to each other. 
Sometimes on a chilly night, I might find them, you know, perched close together at night. So I think they do enjoy the companionship in this, you know, education rehabilitation situation, but I wouldn't expect it in the wild. Right. And I, I'm looking at Sibley right now and his ruby throat is practically glistening on the screen. So like what makes, what makes his throat look so bright and almost iridescent? And are there any other fascinating facts that you might know about hummingbird bodies? Sure. So that red that you're seeing at the moment, oh, there's the real color actually of the feather. There is no red pigment in his throat feathers and in ruby throated hummingbirds feathers at all. The color that we see is what we call a structural color, similar to a rainbow or the colors that we see on a soap bubble. The feather structure is scattering light in a way that makes us see those ruby colors. And depending on the way uh, the light is hitting Sibley, his throat could look gold or orange, sometimes even has some green hues. But if you have no light on the feather, it's actually almost black. Some preening there. That's kind of interesting. I, I, if I could just sidetrack for a second, but Sibley has, a, that right wing is broken. And so in the wild, hummingbirds actually reach behind their wings to scratch and preen, but Sibley can't manage that with that broken wing. So he's learned to reach in front of his uh, wing and it's really cute. <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. Um, so, so kind of famously, right? Hummingbirds have a very fast metabolism. And how does that, how does that impact them um, on migration, during migration, preparing and actually during the migratory journey? Hummingbirds do have an incredible metabolism. I think they need something like 50 times the energy, uh, caloric energy that we need uh, to maintain their body temperature. So before they migrate, they will actually double in weight and they use that fat reserve to, to get them you know, a lot of them are my, making a nonstop flight across the Gulf of Mexico as their last leap to the tropics for uh, the fall winter season. So they will, you know, maybe double in weight from the weight of a penny to maybe a nickel. Uh, and that by the time they get to the other side, they've burned off all that weight, which is why it's really important on both ends here and down on their wintering grounds for there to be the right nectar and food sources available at the right times. Right. It, it's interesting to think about considering that um, Sibley doesn't migrate anymore, but still may have um, sort of cues that might indicate it's time to put on that fat. Do you see that, that um, his behavior changes or his fat um, accumulation changes during and leading up to migration, even though he doesn't, he's not releasable and actually won't be migrating? I, it's hard to say, but I, I think they kind of do get hungrier in fall and spring. You know, in spring, uh, right before they come back, as I said, they molt. So they do have those extra caloric needs. And I think they do get hungrier and maybe Polly in particular seems to get a little more restless, a little more of that zoo and roo uh, in spring and fall. Cool, so someone named Eleanor on Zoom wants to know, how long do hummingbirds live and how long do you expect Sibley and Polly to live? Hummingbirds have an average, or ruby-throated anyway, which is my level of uh, expert, my area of expertise. They have an average lifespan of three. So Sibley has just hit his average lifespan. They have, ruby-throated have been, that have been banned and have been found um, at age 10. And I think the oldest recaptured or you know discovered banded ruby throat was 12, not ruby throat, sorry, but hummingbird species was, was 12. So they can live quite a long time for such a tiny little bird. As far as we know, Ruby, uh, Sibley and Polly are the only ruby throated hummingbirds used for education. So mm -hmm. we, we don't really know that we're very excited that he just hit turn three. <laughs> 
Well, happy belated birthday to him. So do you, Shelly on Zoom wants to know, do you need a license to care for these hummingbirds? Yes, and I'm really glad she asked that. I meant to me uh, mention that when, when you asked me about how they came to me uh, after they were injured in a window collision because I volunteer as a wildlife rehabilitator. Uh, I was asked, was I interested in, in taking on their care? But it's an extensive process with US Fish and Wildlife and your State Department of Natural Resources to have a bird of any kind for any reason. So yes, I had to go through the permitting process and uh, detail my experience and how the birds would be, you know, what their care would be like, how they would be used in education. Right, I'm sure they're they're both in very good hands <laughs> in your home. So if someone wants to, is there a way um, our viewers could maybe meet Sibley in person? Sure, so if you're in the Metro Atlanta area, we are available to come to your group. Um, we particularly enjoy outdoor meetings. Sibley and Polly spend a lot of time outdoors, but we are resuming some indoor activities. Prior to COVID, we were visiting classrooms and retirement homes, anywhere there's an interest in learning about hummingbirds. Uh, during COVID, we've been very active on Zoom. So those of you that aren't local, uh, we can teach you more about hummingbirds on Zoom as well. I anticipate you're probably gonna get a big response <laughs> after this, Melanie. Um, uh, and you covered uh, how Polly and Sibley came to you through the collision. Um, but what are some threats that hummingbirds face in the wild? So window collisions obviously are a big one, free roaming cats, uh, but you know, some of the biggest ones are pesticides, okay, which poison the food supply and water supply and climate change. Because these birds, as I said, particularly when they migrate, are relying on you know, seasonal emergence of insect populations and nectar sources. So climate change is a big threat to throw off the timing. You know, we're changing these cycles in a very short period of time, whereas these birds have evolved over um, millions of years to time their migrations. So climate change is a big one. Um, but yeah, keeping your cats indoors, treating your windows, you know, planting native plants, all of those are uh, great ways to help. Light pollution, I don't think we talked about light pollution, but right now at the tail end of migration, turning down lights at night. So birds that make these long migrations, they don't stop uh, when the sun goes down if they've got distance to cover. So giving them dark skies helps too. Absolutely. Thanks. And um, so you did mention cats and absolutely we want to encourage people to keep their cats indoors. Do they have any um, natural predators in the wild? Snakes. I mean, anything that can get to their nest, you know, as nestlings, they are you know, subject to any number of predators, snakes, squirrels. You know, the number two predator of baby birds is chipmunks um, after snakes. So really anything that, you know, could get to the nest, but an adult hummingbird has few predators, but you will have cats get them at feeders and um, we see a lot of them and we, you know, a lot of birds with cats in rehab, sadly. Right, and on the flip side of this, given all these threats that they do face in the wild, what are some ways that people could help uh, wild hummingbirds flourish and thrive? So I would say probably the number one thing you can do is plant native plants. And I know that Audubon's gonna provide a great resource for you to find native plants to your area, but not only do native plants have the, you know, a lot of them have the, you know, flowers and nectar sources that hummingbirds love. They also support the insect life that hummingbirds need. I've got some coral honeysuckle here that Sibley might want to taste. I'm not sure why anyone would plant the invasive, you know, Japanese 
honeysuckle and we've got this gorgeous honey coral honeysuckle but planting native plants that provide nectar and support insects uh, treating your windows as i mentioned turning down your lights at night keeping your cats supervised or inside and not using pesticides please don't spray pesticides in your yard you can see how if you just sprayed all your bushes with pesticides uh, this is how this bird eats he's going to just you know lap that right up it's yeah these are all great tips thank you for sharing them, um, Melanie. And thank you so much for joining us today. Um, I think it is safe to say that Sibley might be our tiniest guest yet on I Saw a Bird. So yeah, thank you as well, Sibley. Thanks for having us. And I'm sorry for my clumsiness with the, uh, the technology at the beginning, but hopefully everyone was able to get a good look. No need to apologize. I think that we could probably sit here for quite a, lo a long time and watch this. So yes, thanks again, Melanie. Thanks, Sibley. And thanks to Polly as well. Uh, so as um, all, we always do at the end of the show, we're going to turn to one thing that you can do to help birds from the comfort of your home. And like we promised, we're going to show you how to take direct action for the Recovering America's Wildlife Act today. Uh, now we had the chance to learn about the act earlier, and now we're gonna use Audubon's Action Center to speak up for birds in their habitats. By filling out the form that you see here with your name and address, we will find your local US representative and provide a message template that you can personalize. And I think my name is on there, uh, lucky me. Um, so once you're ready, hit send message and we'll deliver it directly to your representative's inbox. That's just how simple it is. All right, so please this month do join us in supporting the Recovering America's Wildlife Act and help save birds and other wildlife from the brink. And we will drop the link to that action page in the comments as well. So I think that's what we have for you today. Um, thanks for tuning in. Uh, we really hope that you'll join us for our finale episode, which will be happening uh, in the end at the end of June. So thanks for joining. Thank you, everybody.